Please join me in welcoming Robert Rubin to the Council. Thank, thank you, Kevin. It says here, please speak clearly into the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> so I will attempt to do that. Um, okay. You know, I, I couldn't help it. It was a very kind introduction. I thank you. I remember once when I, Larry Summers was my Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, and I remember once Larry and I were, went someplace together, and he was supposed to introduce me, which he did. He got up as I, Kevin did with you all, but instead of being kind and <laughs> as, as Kevin was, he said, it is my duty to introduce Bob Rubin, and then he sat down. <laughs> So I got up and I said, thank you for remembering my name, <laughs> and from now on I'll introduce myself. But it, it was a nice introduction, I thank you. Okay, uh, what I'm going to do is, as Kevin said, I'm, I'm going to discuss the outlook, at least my views, as to the outlook for the U.S. economy, of both the short term and the long term, and I'm also going to make some, I guess you'd call them, conclusionary comments on the Eurozone. And I'm going to do that from a, a dual perspective, if you will. One of them is that I am an investor, and I'm a, a, a troubled investor, and so it will be from that perspective. And secondly, I've remained very much involved in the national policy dialogue, and in that respect, too, I, I have de very deep concerns, so it will reflect both of those perspectives. Let me start by saying that I've been around markets, I've been around economic issues for a long, long time. And I think that the outlook for the United States economy short and long term, and I would add for the global economy as well, is the most complex and uncertain in my lifetime, at least in my adult lifetime. And that suggests to me, at least, attaching a very high level of uncertainty to the probabilistic judgments you make as you think about your investment decisions, your business decisions, or your personal financial issues. And let me, ex and by the way, and that obviously creates a, a very difficult decision-making environment for investors, for business people, for policymakers, and for all others. And let, me, let me exemplify this uncertainty with, with the following anecdote. Uh, I'm part of a small group at the Council of Foreign Relations that has dinner together about once every six weeks or thereabouts. And it consists of highly experienced economists, some of whose names you would know. I mean, it's not the same people all the time, but it comes from a pool that's the same all the time. Highly experienced economists, as I say, some of whose names you know, uh, some very uh, well-established and highly successful private equity and hedge fund managers and some policy people. One of the questions that we very often discuss is what is the probability that our political system will address the unsustainable fiscal outlook that we face? And I'd have to say that there's, there's a lot of uh, very serious concern on that score. And that very serious concern is itself one major uncertainty. If we do not address that fiscal, unsustainable fiscal outlook, then what are the consequences? And this makes, further exemplifies the uncertainty we face. Some in that group think that what we'll try to do is to monetize our debt, and that will result in a very high rate of inflation. Some feel almost just the opposite, which is that we'll get higher interest rates because of the imbalances in supply and demand for capital, and the result is that we will have slow or maybe even stagnant growth for an extended period of time. And then there's some, and I'm in this group, who think that while those other two are certainly very real possibilities, that the more likely possibility, or the more likely probability, is that if we don't address these fiscal issues, and I'll be discussing this later, that the result will be some kind of very serious crisis in our currency and bond markets. And the point of this is not to opt for one or other of those, kind of those possibilities, but simply to point out how here this very sophisticated group of people can come together and have three such divergent views, and that makes my point about uncertainty. Let me move on by saying that I'll now go into a, my views on a whole host of issues. Some of them, I think, are somewhat uh, counter-conventional. You may not agree with the views I have, but I do think that every issue I will raise is one that all of us, each of us, has to think through our own conclusions to if we're going to navigate in this really quite extraordinarily complex and uncertain world. As to the short term, uh, which is I'm defining for this purpose as, say, 2012, I think the outlook remains really quite uncertain. Uh, Kevin had a somewhat more optimistic uh, 
perspective and i hope it's right there certainly have been more positive numbers and those numbers continue to build and as that happens i think more and more analysts are raising their projections some now as high as three percent or thereabouts for two thousand and twelve and that could certainly be what happens and i certainly hope that's what happens but i think we also face very serious headwinds and i think we have some serious tail risks and tail risks as you know are these low probability events with very large consequences although unfortunately i think right now May, some of those events may not be so, such low probability, and I'll get back to the tail risk in a moment. In terms of the headwinds, uh, yes, the consumer position has improved, but the consumer still is, by historical standards, in a more difficult financial position uh, than has been the average case. Uh, we've had roughly stagnant median real wages. We have uh, fiscal drag at the state level. We still have some fiscal drag left at the federal level, though a lot of that's been solved. We have the adverse uh, confidence effects on business and consumers of our unsustainable long-term fiscal situation. There are various issues around housing and foreclosure that still, and housing prices that still affect our economy. And that list goes on and on. There are also some questions about what some of these more positive numbers actually mean. And I'm not gonna get into that right now because that itself is a rather lengthy subject, but I, I do think some of those, those more positive numbers are themselves subject to real question uh, upon analysis. Let me go back to the tail risk for a moment. As I've already said, I think some of these have a non-trivial probability of materializing. And if they do, they could have severe consequences. Let me men mention the three that I'm most focused on that are probably the nature of tail risk is that it's the things that you don't think about that wind up creating the most trouble for you. But the three that come to my mind, the possibility of, of geopolitical difficulties, and we all know there are a lot of issues around Iran and, and other issues, uh, Pakistan, a nuclear country with a highly unstable political situation and so forth. A second one would be the possibility of Eurozone failure to achieve stability within the period of this year. And I'll just try to get to a little bit of time, at least on the Eurozone at the end of this. And then the third is one that I think is a, ver which I do think is a very, very low probability but not impossible, and that is that we get the kind of unexpected, sudden, and vicious change that can take place in markets, but it happens in our markets, and we have the kind of fiscal disruptions, or fiscally caused disruptions in our bond and currency markets that I mentioned before. I think the probability of that within the short term is very low, but I don't think you can totally rule it out. You put all this together, as I said a moment ago, I think we're still at a, a, a quite unclear I think the outlook for 2012 is still quite unclear. If you try to translate that into numbers, uh, consensus estimate these days, you know, it's kind of interesting when you talk to business people, others, there's a lot of talk about the fact the numbers are better. The numbers are better, people feel better about it. As I said a moment ago, hopefully that is what's gonna turn out to happen. But then when you look at the actual estimates that analysts are making, a lot of them, the consensus estimate is still a, a touch under two and a half percent for this year. Although there's some now up to three and even a bit more. My own view is that, that the, what actually turns out to be the case could be any number within a very wide range of that 2.5%, uh, more or less 2.5% consensus estimate, and I think unemployment is likely to remain stubbornly high. Policy could make a difference. I think that the stimulus that was enacted uh, for this year was an important thing to do, and it did fill most of the fiscal drag, though not all of it. Beyond that, and more broadly, there was this raging debate between the question of whether we should focus on jobs and growth, given our economic situation, or we should focus on deficit reduction. I think that's an absolutely false choice. And let me look at it from the perspective for the moment, not for the moment, the perspective of current job growth, current jobs and current growth. I have, I have a fair bit of, inter actually quite a bit of interaction with, with business leaders from medium size and large companies most particularly, I get more so from large companies. And I think almost universally, I hear them say that our unsustainable fiscal outlook is significantly and having a significant adverse effect on, on business confidence. And basically for two reasons. One is it creates a lot of uncertainty about what future policy and economic conditions would be like. And secondly, it adds to the already very substantial concern about our ability to govern. I believe what we should do, and should have done already, is to have a serious deficit reduction program combined with stimulus 
and that the deficit reduction program should be enacted now, <laughs> but the implementation should be deferred for two or three years to give uh, the recovery a little more time to get traction. And that more or less is the framework that Erskine Bowles and Alan Simpson set out in, in Simpson Bowles, including the deferral. If you'd had that combination, you'd have the benefit both of the stimulus now creating demand at a time we have a terrible paucity of demand, and you'd also have a significantly increased confidence. I don't personally don't think we're going to have a strong recovery until we address our fiscal issues. Obviously, political reality is nothing's going to happen between now and the election. But after the election, it seems to me there is a possibility something could happen, and I'll get back to that later. Let me very briefly mention three other policy areas that I think could make a difference in the short term. We have got to address housing, but the reason we haven't addressed housing is not lack of will, but it is the enormous complexity of doing so. Two, President Obama issued an executive order a year or thereabouts ago saying that we need to have strong regulatory protection combined with cost-benefit criteria. And I think the more that that order can take hold, the more benefit we'll get, both in terms of direct effect on economic activity and also boosting business confidence. I also think that that executive order provides a better a framework that could make it lend itself more readily to increasing regulation where we need it, because I think it would create more confidence in the regulatory process. And finally, I think we need greater engagement between the business community and the administration, so that in order for each to better understand the problems and perspectives of the other, so as to create a better working environment, which I think could lead to better policy and more confidence. Three more comments about the short term. I think the probability of a double dip is very low. I think the economic policies of the last three years have contributed significantly to avoiding what could have been a falling into an abyss as a result of our financial crisis and also to making conditions better than they otherwise would have been. And I think monetary policy is probably pretty much stretched to its limits. I think some variant of QE3, or rather, some, yeah, some variant of a QE3, as an example, would have very little effect, if any, on interest rates because they're already so low and because so many other much more powerful factors are affecting interest rates. And more importantly, even if there was some minor decline in interest rates as a result of a analog to QE3, I think it would have relatively little effect on business or consumer decisions compared to all the other factors that are affecting business and consumer behavior. But all of us remember from college economics the idea of push, monetary po pushing on a wet noodle, which is the idea of monetary policy that doesn't have any effect because it doesn't affect the actors in the economy, and I think that's where we are now. I also think, oh, and, well, the other possibility, of course, is that if you have uh, a QE3 analog, that could help stock prices and that could have a wealth effect. But again, I think that with interest rates so low, already that the effect, whatever little additional effect you might have in interest rates, would be insignificant with respect to the effect on stock prices compared to all the other factors. And let me just digress for one moment because it sort of relates, it does relate to this, uh, to the effect of monetary policy on, on, on stock prices. One thing I've never forgotten is what a, a very, somebody whose name all of you would recognize, a friend of mine, a very sage observer of markets said to me once, and he said that liquidity the effect of liquidity on stock prices is not predominantly a monetary phenomenon, it's a psychological phenomenon. And he said that when market strength is attributed to liquidity and then the market weakens, the analysts all write that liquidity has shrunk. But he said that's not what's really happened. What's really happened is the psychology has changed and money has moved from stocks to treasury bills or money market funds or whatever. And so the thing to keep one's eye on is not monetary policy in, the, in the, the sense of, excuse me, money issuance, but rather on psychology. It seems to me that's right. And there are risks to the analog of a QE3, particularly the possibility that the Fed could lose credibility with respect to its long-term commitment to combat inflation. Or at least if not lose it, it would contribute to the possibility of losing that credibility. As to the long term, all of us know that there is a stark transformation of the global economy underway with global revolution in technology, with the rise of the emerging market countries, China, India, and the like, the competitiveness of their workforces and the rapid increases of productivity in those, in those countries, the broad increase in the range of tradable goods and services, and a great deal else. 
I believe in that context, the United States has enormous comparative advantages and enormous strengths. We are a dynamic society. We have an entrepreneurial spirit. We have flexible labor and capital markets. We have the rule of law. We have vast natural resources now greatly increased by the vast new reserves of, of oil and gas because of the shale technologies and much else. Therefore, in my opinion, we should succeed. And I continue to believe that in, when all is said and done, when you weigh all the pluses and minuses, uh, that in terms of investment, the United States will continue, to, is likely to continue to be, in many respects, the best place in the world to have at least some significant part of one's assets. Having said that, the question of what, how, how our economy turns out is going to be more a political question than an economic question. I'll get to that this way. If we're going to realize our potential, we have got to meet what I think of as three very large baskets, if you will, of policy challenges. And I'll get back to those in just one second. The objectives as we think about meeting our policy challenges should be competitiveness, growth, redressing our stagnant median real wages and our income inequality and economic security. And let me say, again, before getting to the challenges themselves, that our income distributions are a very serious economic issue as well as a social and moral one. Uh, a very well-known economic commentator, well, one of the best-known <laughs> economic figures in our country, once said that, and I think he's right about this, that in order to have public support for market-based economics and trade, which are so central to growth, the predominance of the public has to believe they will benefit from those policies, and that gets you right back to the question of income distribution. In addition, the income distribution problems that we have today, stagnation of medium real wages, and growing inequality. People tend to conflate the two, but they're really two separate issues. Well, they're related, but nevertheless also separate. Are a real threat to our social cohesion, and I think they're a threat to the traditional and historical belief of Americans in the future of our country, and I think they also pose a threat to our political system. So, in my judgment, we all have an enormous stake in effectively addressing our income distribution problems, no matter what our financial position may be. Having said that, it is a very, very complex question in the context of technology increasingly replacing, but making, in, in both services and manufacturing, uh, reducing labor intensity, and in the context of the competition from emerging market countries, and there are ever more com productive workforces, and uh, finally, the increasing range of tradable goods and services. Okay, let me turn now to the three broad policy challenges. Number one, moving to a sound fiscal trajectory for what is today an unsustainable and I think deeply dangerous fiscal outlook. That outlook undermines business confidence, limits our policy resilience for reacting to economic or geopolitical emergency, constrains public investment, it undermines national security. Mike Mullins, the former chief of staff, the former chief of joint, uh, what do you call him? Chief of joint, chairman of the joint chiefs of staff. <laughs> yeah, Mike Mullins, former chairman of joint chiefs of staff, said that our number one national security problem was the federal deficit. That seems to me to be right. And finally, and most dangerously, I believe that these fiscal deficits create a high likelihood of severe adverse macroeconomic or market effects if they are not effectively addressed. And these macroeconomic or market effects could take many forms in a sense of, not in a sense, at the beginning with my anecdote, I, I alluded to this. Number one, we could have persistently low growth because of higher interest rates due to our imbalance of supply and demand for capital. That's sort of an analog to what's going on in, or has gone on for the last 20 years in Japan. Number two, we could have major inflation at some future point, and you can see the concern about that reflected in gold prices. And number three, as I think I said earlier, the one I'm most concerned about personally, well, I think all of these have uh, realistic possibilities of happening. And the one I'm most concerned about, which is a severe crisis in our bond and currency markets with all the, effect, with all the effects that, that could have. Inflation is probably the one that I hear most about from the people that I know in the world that I live in, the concerns about inflation. My own view is that while that certainly could happen, and you can see how, given the political, the, the unwillingness of our political system so far to deal with our fiscal situation, that we may well move toward, or we could well move toward, trying to monetize our way out of, out of that situation. I think on balance, 
the, the cultural commitment at the Federal Reserve Board toward combating inflation is so strong that I think in the final analysis that substantially reduces the probability of that outcome. And as I said a moment ago, it leaves me with the view that the most dangerous and most likely outcome of all this, if we don't act effectively, is, is crisis. Reestablishing sound fiscal conditions and also meeting the needs of government that Americans across the philosophical spectrum want, American, want our government to meet is going to require significant increases in revenues. And there, if you know the arithmetic, there is no way around that. And it is going to require serious constraint on all aspects of spending. And that includes following through on the discretionary caps that were enacted last year. As far as tax increases are concerned or spending cuts, as I said a moment ago, I would defer the actual impl implementation for two or three years to give our recovery a little more time to take hold. All right, that's number one, getting a sound fiscal policy. Number two, we need to have robust public investment within the context of a sound fiscal policy in the areas that are critical for economic competitiveness, education, basic research, infrastructure, programs to, to move to equip the poor to move into the economic mainstream, which is a moral issue, but also a very important economic issue in terms of productivity and reducing social costs. There are those who say, wish to cut those, who advocate cutting those programs. My suggestion would be, as I said a moment ago, that they're absolutely critical for competitiveness, and it's in those areas that the emerging market countries, China, India, and the others, are investing so heavily today. And thirdly, we need reform in a whole host of areas that are central to our economic future, K through 12 education, healthcare, energy, and so much else. Let me focus for one more moment, if I may, on the, the macro, what I think are the really severe macroeconomic or market potentials if we do not address our fiscal condition. It is possible that we could muddle through our current fiscal outlook without the kind of severe effects that I mentioned a moment ago. But I think the, the predominant probability, the overwhelming probability, is that if we do not act preventively, then sooner or later we are going to be forced to act by the kinds of severe effects that I mentioned a moment ago. And furthermore, the longer we wait, the deeper it becomes the hole, the harder it is to reestablish confidence, the harsher the measures will have to be. And if we don't act preventively, and that'll get us into a world of even harsher and more difficult measures. So I believe the danger is grave. I think we must act, and I think we should act sooner. And I think it, it is extremely important, I would say, close to imperative, that we act sooner rather than later. The problem that we now face is that mainstream policy analysts, in a broad sense, would probably agree with my description of the challenges, and while there'd be all kinds of differences about specifics, I think mainstream analysts, even with very different philosophical views and very different views on specifics, could find common ground to move forward effectively on our fiscal challenges and on all of the policy challenges I've just mentioned. The problem, however, is that the politics, as all of you know, is extremely difficult in every one of these areas. Thus, I believe that the ultimate challenge and the challenge upon which the economic future of our country depends is political will and the effectiveness of our political system. Let me end the discussion in the United States with three points. One, there is enormous concern amongst participants in our political system, elected officials, journalists, and others, about whether it will function effectively enough to meet the challenges that I have just described, particularly the, the fiscal challenges. A friend of mine who was in the Senate for many, many years, but left some years ago, told me that when he was there, there was intense political and, and partisan activity. But he said at the end of the day, most of the members had a real commitment to govern, and they would come together, and on most issues, not all issues, on most issues, they would find common ground to move forward. Now, on virtually all issues, almost all members vote unanimously against any proposal that the other party has made. And so we have a, a, a a virt we have very close to a paralysis of government, except in particular instances, and usually there are very special circumstances there. There are many structural problems, and they need to be remedied. Uh, the 60-vote rule in the Senate, for example, used to be that there would be an occasional 60-vote requirement to a filibuster. Now it's a virtual requirement for all actions, except for certain budgetary matters that fall under an exemption. 
And then there's the Citizens United decision. The money has been a problem to begin with, and that decision is exacerbating or multiplying that problem by many multiples, and I think is going to have a significant ad adverse effect on governance as well as on elections. Having said all that, I believe that the most fundamental requisite for improving our political system and getting it back to the point that it needs to be at in order to meet our challenges is an issue that Thomas Jefferson identified a long time ago. And this is a very rough paraphrase, extremely rough, but the idea is right. He said that in a democracy, for elected officials to make the tough decisions, the difficult decisions that are necessary for success, those elected officials have to feel that they will be held accountable by an informed electorate. And I think that the most fundamental issue we face is having an informed electorate that will hold, that, with respect to whom our elected officials will feel they're being held accountable. And the question of getting, an, of having that kind of informed electorate is immensely complicated and it, it, it goes beyond the scope of the time that we have here. But it does involve the question of the media, and that includes very much the new media, it involves the question of our elected officials, and it involves what the public is interested in, and then the, the, if you will, the mutual reinforcing cycle amongst all of those. And the need, I think, is to break through that cycle, and in one place in that cycle, excuse me, convert what is now a problem into a positive, and then I think that could reverse a negative cycle into a positive one and provide the informed electorate that Thomas Jefferson identified so long ago. But how do we, how we do that? It's a rather complex question, to say the least, although I have some thoughts on how it might conceivably, thoughts as to what might conceivably work. Number two, I think over time we will reestablish our political effectiveness. In fact, I think there's a high likelihood. And my reasons are as follows, and I hope that's right. Our historical political resilience, the dynamism of our society, the potential that the public's loss of confidence in our political system, and 84% of the American people today say they do not have confidence in Congress, will begin to affect elections in a way that, elect, that politicians will recalculate their political self-interest more toward compromise and effective governance. And finally, the possibility that the sheer weight of our, our economic issues will cause politicians, or elected officials rather, to behave in a different way. Third and final point with respect to the United States, we are heading into an extraordinarily important point, uh, time, and probably all of you know this, but let me just repeat it very quickly. In the post-election period, period post the election coming up in November, the 2001 and 2003 tax cuts will expire. The payroll tax holiday will expire. The, the spending cuts mandated by sequestration will go into effect, and we will hit the debt limit once again. If you take all those factors together, it's been estimated that if all that happens, it will reduce GDP by about 4 to 5 percent of GDP, which is an immense hit for an already fragile, even if it's a somewhat recovering fragile economy to take. Part, parts of this are unacceptable to both parties, and parts of it, respectively, are unacceptable to one party or the other. And it seems to me that there is at least the possibility that the pressure of those events will cause or bring the parties to work together post-election, in the post-election period, that is to say lame duck and maybe two or three months into January or whatever, in order to reach some sort of constructive resolution of our fiscal issues that meets the challenges that I've described before. It's also possible that they'll simply undo all of these events through various kinds of legislative actions and then continue to kick the ball down the road. Obviously, all of us should be very intensely focused on this post-election period because I think the outcome could be very important, could very importantly set the direction for our country for really quite some time to go. All right, I'm going to wind up with a few comments on the, on the Eurozone. I was going to do this at greater length, but I think in the interest of time, I'm, I'm not going to do that. So, so I'll, make, I'll make my comments very brief. The long-term problem for the Eurozone is they have a non-viable structure, and they're going to have to have, there has to be reform in the Eurozone structure if this is going to remain permanently in place. The more immediate and pressing problem that we read about in the press every day is the need to reach some interim state of stability rather than continuing to run the risk of a failure to reach that interim state of stability, which in my judgment, I think there's a widely held view, 
could have serious or maybe even severe consequences for the Eurozone and the rest of the global economy. There are enormously complex issues in reaching this interim state of stability. I was going to into them, but I, but I won't in the interest of time. Let me just say that I think they are all substantively resolvable. But once again, you get back to the politics, and the politics are very difficult. And so far, at least, the political leadership in the Eurozone has been behind the curve from day one to the present day. Greece was a solvable problem at the beginning if, it had been, if the leaders had recognized it was a solvency problem, not a liquidity problem. And if you go, if you go from that moment to the present day, there is a, big, a succession of those kinds of judgments that have left them behind the curve, and I believe that behind the curve at the present moment. Having said all that, I think the probability is somewhat greater than not, Ho hopefully even significantly greater than not, <laughs> that the political leaders of the Eurozone will do what they have to do because, in order to reach this interim state of stability, because the consequences of not doing so could be so serious and even severe for them, which is what they'll care about, but also for the rest of the global economy. One comment on the European Central Bank. One reason the markets, have, and maybe the primary reason the markets in, in, in a lot of the Eurozone bonds have gotten so much better is because the ECB, as you know, has stepped in with very large liquidity programs. And there's a widespread belief that they will continue to step in with more liquidity in order to buy substantially more time. I have the view that while that certainly is a possibility, I think it's much more likely that the ECB either will not or cannot continue to extend this buying of time beyond some pretty serious limits. And so I think that the time that they're going to be able to buy, or that they will choose to buy, one or the other, <laughs> is a lot less than a lot of people think. And I think this is going to force the political leaders of the Eurozone to a moment of truth. And either they're going to do what they have to do to get into stability or they're not. As I said a moment ago, I think the probability is higher that they will and they won't. But there certainly is plenty of risk, and that's why I put it in my list of tail risks. Let me wind up then and conclude with two points. Number one, you look at the United States, as I've said a moment ago, I believe our economic future is dependent on the effectiveness of our political system. And I think that all of us as citizens have many ways that we can try to influence that possible outcome by emphasizing to our elected leaders that we expect them to act with seriousness and that we expect them to engage in a constructive way in making our political system work. And number two, as investors, business people, and participants in many other ways in our economy, I think that we should, oh, let me put it differently, <laughs> I think it is sensible and prudent to plan on a continuation of an unusually high level of uncertainty with respect to the outlook. And that means both a meaningful probability of positive outcomes, but also a meaningful probability of significant difficulty. And I think that as we plan whatever we're going to do as business people, investors, policymakers, or the like, we need to take into account significant probabilities on both ends, or toward both ends, I should say, of the spectrum. With that, I thank you for inviting me to share my thoughts with you, and I or we, I'm not sure how this is going to work, would be delighted to respond to anything that you would like to raise. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Secretary Rubin. Now we'd like to go out to the audience for questions. If you'd please raise your arm, make sure it's a brief question, and wait for the mic. Yeah, right there next to Craig, please. Uh, my name is Mark Dykstra. I'm, I'm very curious to know your ideas about creating a, a better educated electorate, because what you've been saying tonight is understood by, what, 3% of the folks in the country? You, you mean the substance of what I said? Well, I don't fully understand it, so, <laughs> so I, I would not put myself in the 3%, so I don't know who you're identifying in that 3%. Anybody who thinks they fully understand this stuff doesn't begin to understand it. It is, in my opinion. Look, what do I think? I'm not sure what the right answer is, but I, I think there are a number, let me, I'm going to be very brief about this. I could go on at length, but let me go very brief. I think that the answer to this could lie, or one possible answer, could lie in the new media. Right now, it seems to me, they are, the new media is in fair measure an echo chamber for ideology, politics, 
uh, opinion without base, factual allegations without base because there are no editorial standards and so forth. But <laughs> the new media has tremendous uh, capacity, as you know, for communication, for providing information, and for engaging public interest. And so my hope is, and I, and I know there are people who are thinking seriously about this, my hope is that the resources will be developed, and I think it's going to take very substantial resources, to turn the new media into part of the answer to this so that you have a communication of, of important information, but you have it done in a way that the public engages with it, because otherwise it won't have the kind of meaningful effect that you could have. So that's, that's one possible answer. Listen, another would be uh, what I said a moment ago, and I don't know what the probability of this is, but if the elections, both this time and maybe the next time, turn out to displace a lot of incumbents, it may be that our political system, Kevin, that the elected officials will decide that maybe <laughs> a, a different mode of behavior will work better politically and will begin providing the leadership, the substantive leadership, that many of them are well equipped intellectually to provide, and that could help, obviously could have a major role in educating the public. Okay, next question. Um, the lady right here, please, in the blue shirt. The mic's right there. Hi, thank you so much for coming today. I know this is a simplistic approach. This is the first time I've been to this um, Chicago Council of Global Affairs, but sometimes when I watch the political leaders, I feel like I'm watching a bunch of children on television. And I'm wondering, is there any way we can do it? And I don't even know they, if they have this. It just seems like on a standstill. So polar opposite. Is there any way, I know this is a simplistic approach, but really get some the best minds in the world to have be mediate against these, you know, the Democrats and the Republicans. It's sickening, and our children are watching it. And it just makes me crazy. Did, did, did you say mediate? Yeah, like a mediator to, to get these okay, guys I together. Yeah. It's, it's, I, it's, I, I, I don't yeah, think. Yeah, diversity, trying how to get along, let's come. It's, it's just I like, it. I hate to watch it. Yeah, and I, it should be rated R on TV. Kids should not watch the news, political news. Yeah. I, I think in saying that our, our political system reminds you of children is somewhat offensive to children, but in any event. <laughs> but, but, no, I have two grandchildren, and I, just on their behalf, I <laughs> react with umbrage. But, you know, the, the irony is, and I, I think, Kev, I don't know if Kevin would agree with this, and Kevin's had a lot of experience in that world. There are a lot of very capable people in elective office. I mean, there's some who perhaps are not so capable. But there are a lot of people in elective office, and I actually think some reasonable number of them, if they could do it, would, would, would behave in a constructive fashion. I mean, there'd always be this partisan stuff and everything else. But the problem is that our political system has now gotten to the point where that, at least it's their belief that that won't work politically. Look how many, at, at the number of, uh, this is not a partisan comment, it's just an observer of what's happened. If, uh, some reasonable, some, it's not a lot, but, uh, but a, at least enough to make a, uh, make a visible impact of conservative Republicans have been displaced in primaries from the right. And I can assure you the same thing could happen on the left. I mean, it's not a, restricted to one party. So I don't, I think we, I, I think how we're going to address this, how we're going to solve this is, is sort of, I raised a number of possibilities. Though I, 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 <laughs> I am a zillion miles from having what I at least think is a, is a really uh, reassuring, a fully reassuring approach. But I think, it's, I, think it should be our I think it should be the primary focus of everybody who's interested in public life and really in the future of this country. The mediator idea doesn't work because we have a political system and we elect public officials to make our decisions. We tried a little bit of mediation when we set up the, uh, that other commission, not the one that was, it was gonna be a congressional commission, uh, a congressionally, uh, authorized commission on, on deficit reduction, but that didn't get through the, didn't get the necessary 60 votes in the Senate. So instead there was one appointed. And as you may remember, it couldn't get, <laughs> it couldn't get, it, it couldn't get a, a, uh, an agreement amongst the various factions, and so it wound up failing. I don't think we're gonna get around the fact that we have a democratic political system, we've gotta make that work. I don't think there's some substitute for it. Uh, somebody who was, Peter Orzak, who I think spoke here some time ago, Peter has the idea that we should try to put as much of this into, into analogs to the base closing commission as possible. That is to say, commissions that, excuse me, are given the authority to do something and then, and then are in a situation where Congress cannot undo that 
except I suppose by extraordinary votes. But I, I don't, I think that's not the way our political, I don't think our, our governmental and political system is going to work that way. I think somehow or other, we've got to make this democratic political system work if we're going to be succeed as a country. As I said, when you consider the, the political history of America, dynamics of our society and all the rest, I think the odds are we will. But we certainly are facing a lot of very difficult questions and no guarantees, and there's just a heck of a lot to do. Uh, in the front row here, please. But I think Chris. you should stop offending our children. <laughs> oh, over here, please. Thank you. Hi, uh, Chris Koskiuk. Uh, I was wondering if I could get your comments on the Dobb-Frank uh, proposal. We, we all know this is an attempt to reform our financial system. I was just wondering if you could uh, comment how effective you think it is. Uh, is it going to prevent uh, a meltdown like we saw in 08, 09? And what would you do to maybe change the system or revamp that law? Let, let me give you a brief comment on a very complex subject. I think the bill was 2,300 pages or something. Am I right about that? So 23, I mean, we could go through each page if you'd like, but <laughs> we'd be here a while. Also, I'm not familiar with each page by a long shot. Let, let me give you a broad comment and then a couple of specific things. The crisis, the 07, 08 crisis, was a function, at least in my opinion, of a whole array of powerful forces all coming together at the same time. And they led to a crisis that virtually nobody, and I'll include myself in this, virtually nobody saw a mega crisis that virtually nobody saw as a realistic possibility. And that includes the regulators, the big institutions, the endowment funds, the analysts, the congressional oversight people. With the exception of a handful of, of, of hedge fund and other managers, I'm talking about a handful, nobody saw this coming. And, and, it's, and, it, and, it, and its great severity was precisely because it, 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 virtually nobody saw it coming. Because had people, had there been a larger number of people who saw it coming, then they would have acted preventively and so forth. And that includes, as I say, the regulators, big institutions, pretty much everybody. So we, we, what we found was that the downside of our financial system was far greater than virtually anybody had thought. That leads you to, it seemed, at least it seems to me, logically used to conclusion that the regulatory structure was also inadequate for dealing with the downside that we now knew we had. And so I think we needed major regulatory reform. And we now have it. As far as the bill itself is concerned, I, d I don't have too many observations. I'll make a couple. I think that the Consumer Protection Agency was a very good idea. First place, it turned out there were a whole host of practices that shouldn't have taken place that hurt consumers. And secondly, I think it will reduce uh, systemic risk by protecting consumers against the kinds of practices that are not in their interest and that uh, led, obviously, to very serious problems in housing, mortgages, et cetera. So I, th I think that's a very good thing to do. Obviously, all these things depend on how they're, they're implemented, but I think the concept was right. Um, in terms of derivatives, Tim Geithner proposed a number of measures that I think are constructive. I wrote a book that came out November 17th, uh, 2003, still available in paperback, by the way, for those who are interested, in which I said that I thought, even back when I was at Goldman Sachs, that derivatives posed some very serious systemic problems, and I thought they needed to be dealt with. I think that the measures that Dodd-Frank has are constructive. I still think the most significant, no. <laughs> the most effective way of dealing with the issues that derivatives pose, and as I said in my book, it's all it's there for those who are interested. I think those, those are significant problems, would be greatly in, increased margin and capital requirements. The Volcker Rule is obviously very controversial. I noticed that the regulators the other day announced they're deferring the, the definition of, of proprietary trading versus market making, and it's understandable why it's being deferred. That, that's a, a very complicated line to draw, and I don't think we can evaluate that rule until we see how this is done but it could have very substantial effects on how market making is conducted here and around the global economy. Depends on, as I say, on, on how those lines are drawn and their deferral was based on the difficulty of finding, an understandable difficulty in, in finding a way to draw that line. I guess my final comment would be, goes to your question, I've forgotten how you put it exactly, but does it give us assurance we won't have such a crisis again? The financial markets throughout their history have had crises. And if the whole history of financial markets is periodic crisis, I think that it's logical to assume that there will be crises of one sort or another in the future. Look at the, Euro look at the Eurozone crisis right now. So I think what we have to do is protect ourselves as best we can against systemic risk, recognizing there's always a balance. I mean, you could have no crises by having no markets, but that has its own problems. No, I'm serious. These things are all balances. But I do think Tim Geithner was right and this is my, my final comment on this, when he said that the 
most important the most powerful protection against financial crisis and he said was capital 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 and that is true in basel three is focusing on increased capital requirements the problem of course is now a lot of the policy makers are saying that as you increase your capital requirements you're also reducing the capacity of financial institution to lend so they're saying lend 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 and the regulators are saying capital 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 so <laughs> how that's going to be resolved i do not know but it, like all other things there are no simple answers and and life is trade-offs and making sensible cost-benefit decisions, risk-reward decisions in this case. Uh, yeah, Jim Stone, please, in the second row from the back. Uh, Bob, uh, what do you think of a couple of practical uh, ways of solving the problems that you enumerated of growth and the deficit? Uh, one, for example, would be putting 10,000 people, 10 million people to work. That would cost about 300 million at 30,000 each and could be paid for by eliminating the uh, federal uh, programs, the giveaway programs, the uh, welfare programs, and so on, plus they would pay taxes. And the deficit can be uh, resolved. Uh, what do you think about resolving the deficit simply? Uh, but, uh, if we have a deficit that no elected officials or their staff get paid, and if we have a surplus, uh, they do get paid. <laughs> Well, my guess would be, and I'm not an expert on legislative matters, Kevin is, but my guess would be if you introduce legislation saying no more public, fiscal, public officials will no longer be paid until the fiscal problem is solved, you need 60 votes in the Senate for that. <laughs> my guess would be this would not do terribly fair. It'd be easier to solve the deficit problem than get that thing passed. <laughs> and on your other question, uh, I wouldn't eliminate Welfare reform went a long way toward accomplishing what many of the critics of welfare were complained about. I was actually against welfare reform because I was, I was, we were in the cabinet room of the White House and I, I, we all sat around and each one of us told President Clinton what we thought. I said I'm a, I wouldn't do it because I was afraid there were too many holes, too many cracks that, that people who were poor and had psychological problems or weren't equipped to work and so forth could fall through. But on balance, people thought it was the right thing to do. We did do it and I, I think some of that has been corrected. I, it's still sort of troubling thought, to, troubling dimension of this to me. But I don't think you solve the problem by getting rid of welfare and then putting people to work. I think we need to have, at least in my opinion, we need to have a social safety net. I, I think unfortunately the, the, the answers are going to lie in much more difficult issues around raising revenues, uh, constraining expenses, putting the entitlements on a sound, I believe strongly in the entitlements and the social safety net, but they've got to be put on a sound on a sound financial basis, and in the long run, as you probably all know, the, 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 the single most important thing we're going to have to do is we have to control the rate of increase of our overall health care costs, not, not, not the, the Medicare, not, not the health care programs, but the overall health care system, because though it's that rate of increase that is predominantly responsible, not totally, but predominantly, or primarily, let's say, not predominantly, primarily responsible for the rate of growth of the federal health care expenditures and the federal health care expenditures that drive our deficit. But even the policymakers don't agree on what further we should do to try to constrain the cost of our health care system because of the complexities of it, one thing or the other. And then, of course, you got the political system to agree is, is yet a whole other set of issues. So that isn't going to happen for quite some time. Uh, right over here. To get first. your views known, uh, does Tim Geithner call up and say, you know, help me with this problem? <laughs> How does that work? What was the first question again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I remembered it. I would just try to... <laughs> I, I, I was trying to avoid it, not, not that I remember. No, the, I'm no expert on stress tests. The only thing I'll say is that the stress tests that, the, that Tim Geithner as secretary put forward that were kind of criti somewhat criticized when he did it turned out to be real. They were serious. The result was they had credibility, and I think they played a real role in the financial system stabilizing itself. The Europeans put forth stress tests that nobody thought were credible. And they played, and they contributed nothing to reestablishing credibility because nobody believed them. In terms of how do people like Paul Volcker, Larry Summers, myself, and others get our views known in the political system, without coming to any particular political official, because I, when I was a treasury, I had, a, I, when I was secretary, I had a rule to myself: if anybody I spoke to told other people I spoke to them, then I never spoke to them again. <laughs> no, because I, I think there's some obvious reasons for that, but you know. Pe you, People tend to know people, and if you have views, they tend to be ways to get them known. It doesn't mean anybody pay attention to them, but at least you can convey them. Uh, yeah, the woman right here in the front row, please. She's coming right here. 
What advice would you have for the next Secretary of the Treasury? Don't accept. <laughs> 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 and then it's Kevin, I think it was Kevin who said it, if you do accept, figure out how to get out of there as quickly as you can. <laughs> I did that for four and a half years, and it was, it was fascinating, and there were a lot of issues I really cared about, and I learned just an enormous amount about the political system and, and the policy issues. Henry Kissinger had said it before I went there to the White House, actually. He said, you'll have so little time, you'll have to live off your existing political capital. I had just the opposite experience. Now, of course, he knew a lot more than I did, so maybe that's the explanation, but I learned an immense amount while I was there. But I think... I guess, I'll tell you what I think. I think if I had to go, I mean, there's, there's a lot I could say, but I would say that whatever you, wherever you've come from, whatever your experience may be, hopefully it will be applicable. But remember, Washington, if you've never been here before, Washington is a very different place than any place else you've operated. And what you ought to do is recognize that an awful lot of other people, including 30-year-old staff people who've been on the Hill, know a hell of a lot more than you do about what you're going to have to do. When I first went to the White House, I had a fellow working for me named Gene Sperling. I was... 50 some odd, 51 or two. Gene was 20 years younger than I was. And in many respects, I worked for Gene. Because I knew that while I knew more about markets than Gene, he knew a heck of a lot more about how Washington worked. And I would say for the first year that I was there, I really felt that I, well, I, I'm supreme myself. <laughs> I felt that the, that the most important thing I could do was to recognize how much more a lot of other people knew than I knew. So that's the advice I would give him, him or her, or it, or whatever it turns out to be. <laughs> Okay, we have time for one more really brief question. Right there, the woman. Right, right there. Thanks. Yeah. Can you speak to um, your view of the potential impact of term limits and restricting expenditures on elections? Well, I thought and have thought all along that campaign finance reform would be a very constructive thing to do. But the problem is Supreme Court has now said candidates can spend whatever they want of their own money. Now in Citizens United, they've said that corporations can put whatever they want to into these super PACs. Now in theory, at least, not in theory, they're not supposed to be uh, involved with the campaign or any communication with the campaign. And I, I don't know enough to know how realistic that is, but I kind of think people know each other and one way or another, probably they're not totally unaware of what each other is doing. So. I guess, and I don't know, I mean, in that context, campaign finance reform basically becomes a disadvantage for people who are not rich and don't know rich people. So uh, I'm, I'm with very much in favor of campaign finance reform, but I think in the context of the Supreme Court decisions, I, I guess I, I don't think it's really much of, I, I think it actually could be more of, a more of a problem than an answer. However, if there was some way of restricting, this gets into way beyond your court, but if, if there's some way of, of, of really restricting the use of resources. I've forgotten, the fairness, I've forgotten how the fairness doctrine worked, but, so I just don't remember this anymore, but if there were ways of restricting access to TV and other media and one thing and another, so you weren't restricting the spending of money, but you're restricting, excuse me, the use of the various mechanisms that one uses money for, maybe something like that could work, I don't know. I just think right now we're in a, we're in a terrible sea of, of money and I don't know quite how we get out of it. On term limits, I've, I've never been in favor of term limits. I, I think that, yeah, you get rid of some people that you wished weren't there, but you also lose some of the most valuable people you have. We have term limits at City Council in New York, and I think the result is that some of the most experienced and valuable people that we had are no longer there. And I, I think on balance, it's not been a good idea. Let me just, could I make one comment just as I close? Yes, Let me say that it's very easy to be troubled and concerned about the United States, our economy, and the political system on which it depends. And we've covered a lot of that ground in this discussion. I really just thought about this a moment ago. We covered a lot of that ground in this discussion. But I think it is always worth remembering that this has been a remarkably resilient, dynamic country for as long as it's been around. And that's true of both the economy and the political system. And I continue to think that if I had to make a bet on any one country, including the new emerging market countries, for the long term, I would bet on this country. And that doesn't mean I don't think others will do very well. I think China's had immense success since the reform started in 78, and I presume that will, well, I shouldn't say I presume, but it seems to me there's a high probability it'll continue and so forth. But I think we have an awful lot going for us, but there's also an awful lot we have to do to realize that potential. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>